Hello, I'm Ted Pike. Every year, thousands of pilgrims come to this place, Palestine, to discover their spiritual roots. Yet today, it is not just the religious. Mankind in general is turning its attention toward this land. Most of us realize that if World War III erupts, it could begin right here in a collision between Arab and Jew. What are the causes of this conflict between Arab and Jew, a conflict which never seems to go away? Before Zionist settlers came here around the turn of the century, this region was not particularly known for strife. Yet since then, it has known little but strife. Is there something within Judaism itself which acts as an abrasive on this land? To answer that question, we don't need to make another pilgrimage to Palestine. We don't need to visit historic sites or Jewish shrines. Instead, since Judaism is very much a religion of its literature, we need to go where its most sacred teachings are preserved. We need to go to a synagogue, in particular, the library of a synagogue. In every synagogue library, we find hundreds of books, but there are a few which tower above the rest in authority. These include the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia, in the oldest of these, the Jewish Encyclopedia, we encounter fascinating new perspectives on the inner teachings of Judaism, perspectives which are well known to most religious Jews, but unknown to Christians. Most Christians believe that the Judaism of the Old Testament is very similar to Judaism today. Yet the Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on Judaism, says modern Judaism and the Judaism of the Old Testament are very different. It says that after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah in the 6th century B.C. and led the Jews to distant Babylon, the Jews were faced with challenges to their faith they had never before experienced. Ever since the time of Solomon, the religion of Israel had centered around the magnificent temple in Jerusalem with its sacrifices and ritual. The question now became, how could one be a true Jew in a very foreign, even hostile environment? The need arose for a certain class of lay priests called scribes or sophurim to interpret the law in this new setting and make it workable. In time, these scribes became what the New Testament calls the scribes and Pharisees, the greatest legal authorities of Israel for all ages. The Pharisees said there were really two inspired revelations to the Jews. There was the written law of Moses received atop Sinai, but there was also the oral tradition acquired by 70 elders who came to the base of the mountain but were forbidden to proceed farther. The Pharisees said that these 70 elders, or Sanhedrin, received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, a revelation which was never written down, yet took precedent over the written law. When Jesus came on the scene, his reaction was to bitterly denounce this counterfeit tradition. Christ said the Pharisees, by their tradition, had made the law of God of none effect. He considered the Pharisees the most dangerous leadership Israel ever had. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Although Jewish sects such as the Sadducees now disappeared, the Pharisees emerged with even greater power over the Jewish people. The Jewish Encyclopedia describes the new role of the Pharisees. With the destruction of the temple, the Sadducees disappeared altogether, leaving the regulation of all Jewish affairs in the hands of the Pharisees. Henceforth, Jewish life was regulated by the Pharisees. The whole history of Judaism was reconstructed from the Pharisaic point of view. Pharisaism shaped the character of Judaism and the life and thought of the Jew for all of the future. In 135 A.D., all Jews were expelled from Palestine. The Pharisees led most Palestinian Jews in a mass migration back to Babylon. The majority of Jews were already in Babylon and had been since the time of Nebuchadnezzar 600 years earlier. Yet around 140 A.D., Babylon became the acknowledged land of refuge for world Jewry. 
For another thousand years, Judaism flourished in Babylon under the leadership of the Pharisees. Great academies of the rabbis were established and thousands of new laws formulated. There, those same Pharisees who killed Jesus Christ remained the undisputed rulers of Judaism. In Babylon, the Pharisees codified their oral traditions into the Babylonian Talmud, the written form of that oral tradition which Jesus so bitterly rebuked. The Talmud reveals how deep was Israel's apostasy. In her beginning, God gave the Hebrews the loftiest, the most upright literature and ethics the world has ever known. Yet when they turned their backs on him, they produced the Talmud, a work which has aptly been called a monument to human folly. The Talmud also helps us understand the basis for Christ's unflattering descriptions of the Pharisees. Jesus described the Pharisees as hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He even described the Pharisees as children of their father the devil, a murderer from the beginning. The Talmud confirms Christ's words. In the Talmud, in Treatise Sanhedrin, an extensive passage describes the right of the Pharisee to kill anyone, just as long as he did so indirectly. As one of dozens of examples, the Talmud tells us that if one bound his neighbor and he died of starvation, he is not liable to execution. In such an indirect manner, the Pharisees also killed Christ. Manipulating the Romans to actually wield the spear and sword, the Pharisees claimed, as their descendants do today, that since the Romans were the direct cause of the death of Christ, it is the Romans, not the Jews, who are guilty. Christ also called the Pharisees adulterers, an adulterous generation. The Talmud provides generous loopholes for adultery. It says the penalty for adultery does not include sex with a minor, the wife of a minor, or the wife of a heathen. The Talmud also encourages seduction of unwed adolescent girls called designated bondmaids. But it's important how such rapes are performed. With the designated bondmaid, one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection. The Pharisees reason that rape in a perverted manner is outside the jurisdiction of the law. Normal rape, however, was punishable. In Babylon, sexual perversion of every kind had been a way of life for millenniums. The Pharisees were deeply influenced by such practices. In three of the major treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yohai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yohai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, A proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest. Agreeing with ben Yohai, the great rabbah said, When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. For when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. In addition to adulterers, Christ, in the story of the Good Samaritan, portrayed the Pharisees as racial bigots, too self-righteous to respond to the suffering of one who was not a Jew. It is true because of the wickedness of the Canaanites, which included sodomy and infant sacrifice, Israel had been commanded by God to be harsh in her treatment of the inhabitants of the land. God made it clear that the Canaanites were not simply to be avoided, but destroyed. By the time of the New Testament, this method of preserving God's kingdom by separation and the sword had become obsolete. God no longer made a racial difference between men. But the Pharisees were unfazed by God's new agenda. The Talmud was finally written down nearly five centuries after Christ, yet it's critical 
even homicidal attitudes toward Gentiles might have been lifted out of the book of Joshua. However, the quickest way to grasp the Talmudic view of Gentiles is not directly from the Talmud, but from the Jewish encyclopedias. If we quote an isolated opinion from the Talmud, a rabbi may quickly object, saying, but that is not the overall opinion of the Talmud. That is not the definitive view. What the Jewish encyclopedia provides us is a definitive overview of perhaps hundreds of rabbinic statements on any subject, giving us accurate summaries of what the Talmud generally teaches. In its article on Gentiles, the Jewish encyclopedia begins to define what makes a Jew so different from a Gentile. According to the rabbis, only Israelites are men. Gentiles they class not as men, but as barbarians. Since Gentiles are not men in the fullest sense, so the Gentile is not a neighbor of a Jew. Further, since Gentile laws were too crude to admit of reciprocity, meaning too crude to be taken seriously, the Gentile was forever beneath the Jew. Gentiles were outlawed by God from the beginning and thus had no property rights. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they refused to accept it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. Since the Talmud outlawed the child, or issue of a Gentile, as that of a beast, a Gentile had as little legal rights in a Jewish court as did an animal. The Talmud states that if a Gentile sue an Israelite, the verdict is for the defendant, the Israelite. Conversely, if the Israelite is the plaintiff, he obtains full damages. Because the Talmud conspires against Gentiles, if a Jew was ever caught telling a Gentile what the Talmud really says, such a person deserves death. So vile was the nature of a Gentile that the great Simeon ben Yohai said, the best among the Gentiles deserves to be killed. The best of snakes ought to have its head crushed. Jews, however, are exalted beings in the Talmud, worthy of praise. Christ described the Pharisee who blessed himself, saying, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as other men. An eminent Talmudic rabbi says the same. Blessed be thou who hast not made me a goy or Gentile. There is a special antagonism between the Talmud and Jesus. The Talmud attacks him everywhere it can, even his mother. Mary, the Talmud says, was a whore who mated with carpenters. She who was the descendant of princes and governors played the harlot with carpenters. It naturally followed that the scribes declared Christ to be a bastard. In its article on Jesus, the Jewish encyclopedia says that Jewish writings defame Christ. It is the tendency of all these sources to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him illegitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. Jesus, according to this article, was considered one of the three worst enemies of Judaism who came to an ignoble end. The Talmud says they subjected him to four deaths, stoning, burning, decapitation, and strangling. The Talmud also says he is now in hell, punished with boiling hot excrement. What is Christ's advice as he speaks to us out of hell? The Jewish encyclopedia quotes Jesus as telling us above all to bless the Jews. He says, Further their well-being. Do nothing to their detriment. Whoever touches them touches even the apple of his eye. Christians, as followers of the false prophet Jesus, also deserve death. The Jewish encyclopedia again recaps the Talmud's position. A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. It says the Talmud's hatred was probably directed against the Christian Jews. These Judeo-Christians, evasively called Min, Minit, or Minim, were considered by the rabbis to be the most dangerous form of heretics of ancient times. The New Testament Gospels were writings which the rabbis considered more dangerous to the unity of Judaism than those of the pagans. A Talmudic rabbi said, the writings of Christians deserve to be burned for paganism is less dangerous than minute or Christianity. The Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on men, 
continues to illustrate the Talmudic hatred of Christianity. Again, we must remember, Minim usually indicates the Judeo-Christians. It was forbidden to partake of meat, bread, or wine with the Christian. Scrolls of the law, Tephelin and Mezuzot, written by a Christian, were burned. An animal slaughtered by a Christian was forbidden food. The relatives of the Christian were not permitted to observe the laws of mourning after his death, but were required to assume festive garments and rejoice. The testimony of a Christian was not admitted in evidence in Jewish courts, and an Israelite who found anything belonging to one who was a Christian was forbidden to return it to him. The Pharisees, through their Talmud, thus gave the Jews an ethic which encouraged bigotry and isolation. But it did worse than that. It invited persecution. By the 11th century, the inhabitants of Babylon, growing weary of the self-righteousness and dishonesty of the Jews, expelled them to the West. Migrating across North Africa and Central Europe, the great majority of Jews who had lived in Babylon for almost 1,600 years now began to find their destinies in the cities of the West. Yet in coming to the West, found their Christian neighbors extremely intolerant of the antisocial deviations Jews had taken for granted in Babylon. In order to survive, it was necessary to abandon such Babylonian traditions. But that was not as easy as it sounds. For a thousand years, the Pharisees had commanded such deviations. Most Jews could not bring themselves to defy the authority of the Pharisees. Enter one of the giants of Judaism of all time, the great Maimonides. Maimonides, a physician and philosopher, knew that no Jew who practiced Babylonian perversions could remain alive in Christian lands. He attempted to harmonize Greek philosophy with the best points of Judaism. He hoped his rationalizations would enable Jews to abandon their antisocial customs. Yet Maimonides was only partly successful. He was excommunicated by the Jewish community on the charge of making new laws. Nevertheless, his moderation and intellect did in fact temper the old Judaism of Babylon. Gradually over the centuries, Jews abandoned immoral practices of the Talmud. Such practices are not observed today. In fact, most Jews are so ignorant of the Talmud itself that they do not even know that such teachings exist within their sacred literature. Yet the fact remains that when the Jews came to the West in the Middle Ages and attempted to accommodate the Talmud to Christian society, a tremendous conflict was created. In Babylon, Judaism could be perfectly consistent with the teachings of the Pharisees because the Babylonians were immoral as well. In Christian lands of the West, it became necessary to pretend that many of those teachings did not exist. Even today, religious Jews continue to venerate the Pharisees and their Talmud as the greatest source of light that Judaism will ever know. Yet, living in Christian lands, no Jew can fully perform what the Pharisees commanded. This conflict in Jewish responsibility has created a dilemma over the last thousand years from which Jews in the West have not emerged. Yet even before Maimonides came on the scene in the 12th century, Another dilemma was being created in Judaism far to the east. This was a dilemma not concerning the doctrines of the Jews, but over who actually was a Jew. In their articles on Khazars, the Jewish encyclopedias tell us that in the 8th century AD, Jewish missionaries ventured north of Babylon to the land of the Khazars between the Caspian and the Black Seas. Khazaria was a vast grassland on what is now the plains of southern Russia, inhabited by a race of merchants, artisans, and warriors of Hunnish Turkish stock. About 740 AD, the king of the Khazars converted to Judaism and made it the state religion. Incredibly, within a few centuries, the people of Khazaria convinced themselves that they were not Gentiles after all, but the physical descendants of Abraham. Thus, by the 10th century A.D., a nation of proselyte Jews thrived in what is now central Russia. During the Middle Ages, the fierce Mongols from the east and Russians from the north drove the Khazars west out of their ancient homeland. Most settled in Eastern Europe, especially Poland, where they established communities of artisans and traders. 
Judaism thus became divided into two basic groups which remain today. The Ashkenazim, which are the Khazars of the East, and the Sephardic Oriental, which are Jews of Spain, Turkey, and lands bordering on the Mediterranean. Today, the Ashkenazim, or Khazars, are the vast majority, about 80% of those who call themselves Jews. The two most recent premiers of Israel illustrate these two racial types. Shimon Perez is a Sephardic Jew from authentic Jewish stock. Yitzhak Shamir, like Menachem Begin, is Ashkenazim, or Khazar in origin. In Poland, these ancestors of most modern Jews thrived. In fact, they actually became more zealous Jews than their theological cousins to the West, the Sephardim. The Khazars were fascinated with that mystical aspect of Judaism called Kabbalah. Kabbalah was the Jewish form of ancient Gnosticism, a belief that God is unconscious yet everywhere, revealed in different levels of refinement throughout the universe. Of course, Judaism was always unique among ancient religions in its belief in a single conscious God, a God not only capable of creating the worlds, but of punishing evil and rewarding good. Like Eastern religions, however, the Polish Kabbalists believe that God in his purest form is utterly remote, unknowable, without opinions about right and wrong. Instead, his being filtered down through many gradations, or sephirot, until it reached Israel. Israel, according to the Kabbalah, was the visible, rational emanation of God in this world. Below Israel was confusion and darkness, represented by demons and the chaotic world of the Gentiles. What excited the Khazars was that Kabbalah preached revolution. It said that Jews, as superior beings, were destined to rule the world. In the Zohar, which is the written text of Kabbalistic lore, we find the arrogance and ambition of the ancient Pharisees very much alive. In a typical passage, the Zohar teaches, living soul refers to Israel, who have holy living souls from above, and cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth to the other peoples who are not living soul. Only by the overthrow of the Gentiles, the Zohar asserts, can Israel regain its position as God's Shekinah glory on earth. The Zohar calls Gentiles Amalekites. In a passage typical of many, the Zohar says they cause the destruction of the temple. So when God reveals himself, they will be wiped off the earth. Redemption will not be complete until Amalek will be exterminated. But once Israel shakes off Gentile dominion and Christian influence, heaven will descend to earth. The Zohar says Israel will fulfill her predestined role, ruling the world under the leadership of her Messiah. Since the Kabbalah, or Zohar, was not merely a theological system, but taught the overthrow of the existing order, it was natural that before long, Jews should begin to put it into practice. With the age of Voltaire and the so-called Enlightenment, during the 18th century, we see a host of Jewish Kabbalists migrating west out of Poland and penetrating the very capitals of Europe. Jewish wonder workers, Baal Shems as they were called, Saint Germain, Cagliostro, Frank, Falk, men of vast wealth and mystery came upon the European scene at the end of the 18th century. In Europe, in the years preceding the French Revolution, the foundations were laid for a new order in the world. Kabbalists such as Adam Weishaupt helped establish the ultra-secret Illuminati, which became a cover for plots and intrigues that would begin the erosion of Christian civilization. At the same time, beginning with Jewish philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, many Jews began to perceive their religion not simply as a means of personal salvation, but as a way to reform society at large. Many Jewish activists said that, starting with such revolutionaries as Moses and the prophets, Israel had always had the social objective of righting injustice and taking the part of the downtrodden. It was the duty of every Jew, they said, to come to the aid of the oppressed working masses, called the proletariat, in their historic struggle against capitalistic bondage. 
Many Jews thus came out of the ghetto and took part in all the great revolutions of the 19th century, including the Revolution of 1829 and the Revolution of 1848. It is thus not surprising that as the 20th century dawns, we find Jews turning their attentions to the overthrow of one of the last monarchies still opposing Jewish advancement, the Romanov dynasty of Russia. It is well known that the Jews had long hoped to overthrow the Tsar. It was natural then that Jewish philosophers such as Moses Hess and Karl Marx should contrive a philosophy that could make such overthrow possible. It was also natural that international Jewish bankers of New York, London, and Hamburg should finance it. The U.S. State Department, in its three-volume report on the origins of communism in Russia, published in 1931, reveals how Jewish-controlled German banks, under the leadership of Max Warburg, conspired as early as 1914 to send large payments to Lenin, Trotsky, and others in their attempts to bring down the Tsar. As part of this conspiracy, Jacob Schiff, head of the New York Jewish banking house of Kuhn Loeb, invested at least 20 million, which would be close to $1 billion today, toward the establishment of Bolshevism in Russia. In its article on socialism, the Jewish Encyclopedia, published in 1905, freely admits that Jews in Russia were ripe for revolution. In Russia, it, socialism, has become a movement of the Jewish masses. The later Encyclopedia Judaica tells us the communist movement and ideology played an important part in Jewish life, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, and during and after World War II. The Judaica, in fact, presents an extensive list of the most powerful Jewish leaders of Bolshevism, which included Trotsky, Sverdlov, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Litvinov, Haganovich, and many others. The Judaica also tells us just how many Jews fill the communist ranks. It says anti-Semitism drove the bulk of Russian Jewish youth into the ranks of the Bolshevik regime. When the white Russian patriots heroically attempted to regain their freedom from the Jews, the Judaica says compact Jewish masses were utilized by the Bolsheviks to suppress such counter-revolution. Clearly, Jews and native Russians were engaged in a death struggle over the destiny of Russia. Unfortunately, the Jewish masses won. A rare photo shows the First People's Commissariat. From left to right are Yuritsky, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Sverdlov, and Kaganovich, all Jewish. In 1918, intelligence services of the Western powers were buzzing with reports that communism was an international conspiracy fomented by atheistic Jews. British, Dutch, American and other intelligence reports confirmed that Jews filled the Bolshevik ranks and that as much as 75% of all Soviet commissars were Jewish. In the illustrated Sunday Herald of February 8, 1920, Sir Winston Churchill commented on what had almost become public knowledge. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one. In the decades following the revolution, the question became, how much influence do the Jews still exert on the Soviet experiment? Although many of the Jewish kingpins in Bolshevism perished in Stalinist purges in the late 30s, None other than Nikita Khrushchev gives us an eye-opening view of just how many Jews were still in the Soviet government. Speaking to a delegation of French socialists, Khrushchev admitted in 1956 the government has found in some of its departments a heavy concentration of Jewish people, upwards of 50% of the staff. Because communism has historically been top-heavy with Jews, the Soviet policy of so-called anti-Semitism, much protested by Jews in the West, may in reality be but a ploy to distract the world from communism's Jewish past. Although most Jews have indeed been removed from high-profile positions in the Soviet hierarchy over the last 30 years, still Jews remain highly favored when it comes to immigration to the prosperous West. Since World War II, 
More than a million Jews have been allowed to leave the Iron Curtain, sometimes in waves of up to 52,000 a year. This contrasts to the grim reality that if even one Gentile attempts to escape, he would be lucky to receive only 15 years in prison. Jews, then, have played an enormous role in the Soviet experiment. Yet, as the Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on socialism, again tells us, the passion of many Jews to socialize the world was not confusia. As peddlers of socialism, it tells us, Jews must be reckoned among the pioneers of the socialist parties in America. As a case in point, a flood of socialistic Jews entered the FDR administration and helped pioneer the New Deal for America. The Encyclopedia Judaica says Roosevelt's liberal policies endeared him to the Jewish community which shared with him an overriding commitment to the welfare state. It is very significant that in letting left-wing Jews into his administration, FDR set in motion a conspiracy that was soon to have the gravest repercussions. As part of his policies, FDR had a German communist, Klaus Fuchs, a scientific genius who helped mastermind the atomic bomb. Yet Fuchs also headed a ring of eight highly influential Jews who delivered the entirety of our atomic technology to the Soviet Union in the early 1950s. They included Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, David Greenglass, Harry Gold, Sidney Weinbaum, Morton Sobel, and others. Of the ten convicted for espionage, no less than eight were Jewish. Later in 1957, it was discovered that the Jewish Soblin brothers delivered massive defense secrets to the Russians. They acted upon the orders of the Jewish head of the Soviet secret police, Berea. The most recent example of such treachery is the Pollard spy case in which Jewish spy Jonathan Pollard and his wife delivered thousands of top secret documents not to Moscow, but to Tel Aviv. All Jews, of course, are not communists, spies, or even liberals. A small minority of conservatives like economist Milton Friedman, publisher Natty Loeb, and Senator Barry Goldwater are eloquent reminders that Jews are represented on the right as well as the left. Nor should we forget that many Jews have contributed disproportionately to the good of mankind, especially in such areas as medical research, science, and the arts. Such Jews deserve our heartfelt gratitude. Never should we indict Jews as a whole for the misdeeds of some. Yet the fact remains that historically most Jews have favored the liberal agenda. Many have gone as far left as communism. For example, in the late 40s, intensive investigations by the U.S. Justice Department revealed a disproportionate number of Jews in the American Communist Party. In 1949, the 11 members of the American Politburo of the Communist Party were convicted. Six were Jews. In 1951, the second string Politburo was indicted. Of 21 arrested, 14 were Jewish. Also in 1951, 15 top West Coast Communists were indicted. Six of the 15 were Jewish. During the Vietnam conflict, while American boys died by the tens of thousands, Jews dominated the communist New Left in America. The Encyclopedia Judaica says the New Left included a disproportionate participation of Jews in the leadership and sometimes also in the ranks. It continues, Jews have been active in the United States in all radical movements, socialist and communist, old left and new, on almost every major campus in which the new left was active, Jews were prominent in the leadership. Typically, they formed between a third to more than half the leadership and members. Jews also dominate the American Civil Liberties Union, a left-wing front which has tirelessly opposed such fundamental values as prayer in the schools, effective criminal prosecution, even the Pledge of Allegiance. The ACLU has been the subject of frequent congressional scrutiny. As early as 1931, a special congressional investigating committee prophetically described a role which has become all too familiar in recent years. 
It claims to stand for free speech, free press, and free assembly. But it is quite apparent that the main function of the ACLU is to attempt to protect the communists in their advocacy of force and violence to overthrow the government. Today, the ACLU is led by Jewish National Director Ira Glasser, the fifth national director in its history. According to a 1977 ACLU survey of membership, 27.3% of ACLU leaders were Jewish, 21.4% of members. The feminist movement, with its agenda of free abortions and lesbian rights, also contains a lopsided number of Jews in its national leadership. The three most influential feminists, Gloria Steinem, Bella Abzug, and Betty Friedan, are Jewish radicals. Jewish producer Norman Lear also heads People for the American Way, the liberal antagonist to Jerry Falwell's moral majority. People for the American Way videotapes every broadcast of national TV evangelists in hopes of ruining their ministries. Why does such Jewish-led radicalism prosper? Largely because the television media promotes it. And who owns the media? In its article on television, the Encyclopedia Judaica reveals that the big three television networks are Jewish-founded and controlled. David Sarnoff founded NBC in 1926. CBS was founded under the presidency of William S. Paley, also Jewish. ABC was an outgrowth of the NBC network, and another Jew, Leonard Goldenson, became its president. Gentiles usually occupy the visible out-front positions, but each of the three networks remain under Jewish influence or control. According to the famous Lichter Rothman poll of 104 top-level media executives, published in Public Opinion magazine, Jews also dominate the lower levels of network broadcasting. Although Jews constitute less than 3% of the American population, a whopping 59% of TV executives surveyed were Jewish. The Encyclopedia Judaica, in its article on motion pictures, paints a similar picture of Jewish control of the movie industry. With the exception of United Artists, it says, all the large Hollywood companies were founded and controlled by Jews. The largest of all entertainment monopolies, MCA, called the Octopus because of its domination of the entertainment industry, was likewise founded and controlled by Jews, such as Jules Stein, Lou Wasserman, and Taft Schreiber. In its article on publishing, the Judaica presents lists of dozens of the largest publishers in America owned or controlled by Jews. In the Lichter-Rothman poll, it was found that 97% of media leaders surveyed favored abortion on demand, 86% favored hiring homosexuals as teachers, 57% believed that adultery is not wrong, and so on. Clearly, the liberal bias of the Jewish-controlled TV networks is indisputable. Jews are also rapidly gaining control in Congress. In 1976, there were virtually no Jewish political action committees. In 1986, there were more than 70 Jewish PACs. In 1972, there were two Jewish senators and 12 Jewish representatives in Congress. In 1986, there were eight Jewish senators and 30 Jewish representatives. In 1986, more than 50% of the budget of the Democratic Party was paid for by Jews, with Jews paying 25% of the Republican budget. As our study in the synagogue library reveals, there does exist a tendency toward Jewish domination of our society. Where is all this headed? The Right Honorable Winston Churchill wrote, It may well be that this same astounding race may at the present time be in the actual process of producing another system of morals and philosophy as malevolent as Christianity was benevolent, which, if not arrested, would shatter irretrievably all that Christianity had rendered possible. It would almost seem as if the gospel of Christ and the gospel of Antichrist were destined to originate among the same people. Can it be that such pervasive Jewish control which we are seeing today is but the harbinger of even greater Jewish control to come? In the book of Revelation, a great harlot is described ruling the world, riding on a horned and headed beast. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel was described as a harlot, the mother of spiritual whoredom among the nations. Is the harlot of Revelation actually Israel riding upon her false messiah, the Antichrist? 
Today, many believe Israel is on the road to the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah. A great Jewish temple is being planned. A priestly class called the Kohanim is being readied. Ritual sacrifices are being studied. Truly, prophecy is being fulfilled in an amazing way, yet not in the happy way that most of us would like to believe. In Israel today, effective Christianity is outlawed. If a Christian were to walk through any town in Israel passing out New Testaments, he could be sentenced to prison for five years. Israel is not moving toward Christ. She is moving toward her false messiah, Antichrist. In Antichrist, Israel hopes to find all the worldly power and glory which Jesus denied her. But she will not find it. As the Bible teaches, the great harlot Israel will be thrown from the back of the beast. The beast with his ten confederate military leaders will gore and burn her with fire. This is what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation, or time of Jacob's trouble. A time when Israel, who thought she could rule the world, will experience unprecedented agony and judgment for her sins. Since the Bible tells us that Israel is on the road to judgment by God, what should be our attitude toward her? St. Paul tells us that Jews are indeed enemies of the gospel, yet enemies who are beloved for the sake of a remnant which shall one day be revealed. Israel is like the prodigal son, inheritor of a glorious destiny. But she is also rebellious. Like the prodigal son, she must be humbled, not by us, but by God. Someday, out of the great tribulation, a remnant of Jews will look upon him whom their fathers pierced and will plead for his forgiveness. The dry bones of Jewish unbelief will be resurrected. Jewish branches will be grafted back into the vine, which is Christ, Israel's true Messiah. Israel will become as much of a blessing as she was once a curse unto the nations. But there have always existed those who cannot see the big picture, who cannot wait for God to finish his controversy with Israel on his terms. Throughout history, movements have erupted which have attempted to solve the so-called Jewish problem in the most direct way. Yet all such anti-Semitic movements have ended in defeat. Defeat because they refused God's terms and instead resorted to violence and slander, elevating themselves to racial superiority and debasing Jews as racial degenerates. Anti-Semites have become loathsome to all mankind. In contrast, the Bible presents the perfect approach to this problem. All the prophets were heavily burdened, even angry at the transgressions of Israel. Yet when they spoke out, it was as God led them. When they chastised the people, it was not in the arm of flesh. Vehement as they had to be in denouncing sin, they never became bigots. Their message was on the highest ethical level. They told Israel she was sinful, not because she was racially degenerate, but because she had broken God's law. As would be expected, all the prophets were accused of being negative, even anti-Semitic. Jewish King Ahab called the prophet Elijah an enemy of his regime. Jeremiah was accused of being against his own people in favor of the Chaldeans. Micaiah was described as never speaking anything good, but only criticism. Even Christ and the apostles were called enemies of the Jews, yet they spoke out. The great figures of the Bible provide a pattern of how we should respond to the Jews today. The prophets and apostles preached the good news to Israel, yet they were very wary, very realistic concerning rabbinic deception. Our Lord warned us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Considering the Pharisaic origins of modern rabbinic Judaism, his words can only mean be wary of rabbinic Judaism. As we saw earlier, rabbinic Judaism is inherently ambitious. It will forever attempt to establish itself as the dominant factor in society. If Zionism is unnaturally encouraged, as it has been by the church over the last century, then it will rise to a position that is intolerable. Inevitably, mankind smarting under its presumptions will rise against it in new waves of anti-Semitism. 
an angry humanity will pit itself against the Jews. The Jews will fight back. This is what is happening in the Middle East today as Jew and Gentile quarrel over the land of promise. Who owns this land? In her beginning, God promised that through the physical people of Israel, a spiritual blessing, Jesus Christ, would be given to the world. Just as a physical people was necessary, so also was a physical land. Throughout the Old Testament, God repeatedly tells the Hebrews that the land of Palestine is promised to them and their seed forever. Yet in order to occupy this land, Israel must be obedient to him. If not, God repeatedly demonstrated in the Bible that he would actually invite the peoples surrounding Israel to invade and occupy. Only when the Hebrews finally cried unto God in repentance did he allow them to possess a land dedicated to obedience. God's demand for obedience is thus a standard before which both Christian and Jew must bow. Moses, a spiritual colossus, wanted to go into the land, but God would not let him because of one infraction. Today Israel has rejected God's Son for 20 centuries and given first allegiance to those who crucified him, the Pharisees. Yet we are told that God is delighted that they dwell in the land. Does obedience no longer matter? It does. Someday, as in the days of Joshua and Nehemiah, Israel will give God the obedience he demands. They will return to this land in blessing. But until that time, as long as Israel continues to force her unbiblical occupation on the Arabs, this region will only know strife. The Arab world will continue to try to expel the Jews. The Jews will strike back, back and forth, generation after generation. The discord will be unending. This land will continue to bleed. It is the duty of every Christian to support the humanitarian needs of Jews, to preach the gospel to them, but it is not our duty to assure them that a land of promise may be occupied without obedience. Neither is it our duty to fight a war in the Middle East in defense of Israel's unbiblical claim. It is time we return to God's law, a law as old as this land, as old as the God who gave it to the Jews. If we ignore God's requirement of obedience, we only postpone that glorious day when Israel will become what she was meant to be, a place of rest and healing to the nations. If America is to continue to possess her land of blessing, she also must return to the God of her fathers. It is true the Bible prophesies that Jewish international control, or Babylon the Great, will gradually come to dominate the world. Yet the Bible also promises that if a nation turns to him in repentance, he will postpone the judgment he himself has predicted. God is already showing us how he can slow down the Zionist timetable. In 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, ostensibly to destroy the PLO threat from the north. Yet in doing so, she unleashed a reign of barbarity and destruction unequaled in this decade. Not only did Israel bomb Beirut to rubble, killing thousands of civilians, but she actually encouraged the infamous Shatila massacre by providing aerial lighting for the three-day slaughter of hundreds of innocent victims. Despite the bad publicity surrounding such atrocities, Israel was confident that her massive firepower and support from America would make Lebanon her conquered colony to the north. Yet God judged Israel. Like Pharaoh in the Red Sea, he caused Israel to flounder. Today Israel is a nation in turmoil, divided, unable to regain the respect of the world. Although Jewish power continues to increase ominously in the United States, the fact means that God is able to slow it down, but only if we as a nation turn again to our Creator. We must repent of the national sins which have weakened our moral fiber and allowed the forces of Satan to dominate us. In a moment, we'll explain how you may educate others concerning this threat. Yet education in itself is not enough to hold back a demonically empowered conspiracy. We have to have God's power, a power which only comes through total consecration to Him. The communist movement demands that every true Marxist be willing to give up everything, even his own life, for the cause. 
If we are to have power against the Antichrist, we must do as much. We must give our lives totally to Christ, willing to do anything, give up anything, he might ask. Only by such a death to inner hidden rebellion can we really have power in the spiritual realm. Only by such sanctification can we know what it is to walk with God as true Christian soldiers, capable of action, but also of hearing the Holy Spirit's voice of love and restraint. The first step toward holding back Zionist expansion is thus, national revival, a transformation of hearts that begins in each one of us and then spreads across this broad land. But just as importantly, the church in America must turn from its unconditional support of Israel. For three quarters of a century, the church has aligned itself with bloody and arrogant men in the Middle East. In bidding them Godspeed, it has become a partaker of their injustices. Tragically, such a policy has alienated the Muslim world from the gospel. Because the church has historically ignored the plight of the Palestinians and sided with their oppressors, the Israelis, the Arab world has closed its ears to the message of Jesus Christ. In fact, by giving unconditional approval to Israel, the church more than any other institution has helped build up the walls of that system which will ultimately become Babylon the Great. The church must now face the fact that Israel today is not the fulfillment of the sublime prophecies of the Old Testament, prophecies which are conditional upon obedience. Instead, modern Israel is the first stage in Satan's plan to take this world from Christ and give it to Antichrist, Israel's false messiah, who will rule the world from Jerusalem. This scenario is borne out by none other than Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, one of the great founders of Israel. Recorded in an astonishing article in Look magazine, Ben-Gurion predicted that a one-world system presided over by Jerusalem will be set up in the near future. All continents will become united in a world alliance at whose disposal will be an international police force. All armies will be abolished and there will be no more war. In Jerusalem, the United Nations, a truly united nations, will build a shrine of the prophets to serve the federated union of all continents. This will be the seat of the Supreme Court of Mankind to settle all controversies among the federated continents as prophesied by Isaiah. Ben-Gurion's vision of Israel in dominion of the world is identical with the vision of the great harlot ruling the nations as given in Revelation 17. Yet it's a vision which may be postponed. If enough of God's people rededicate themselves to him and turn from support of a system which seeks their ruin, then Zionist world control can be turned back, at least within our time.